teach you some culinary techniques. So how to cook uh, what's local, uh, common vegetables, meats, and other ingredients. Although you've gone to classes and uh, you've probably talked to some friends and I'm going to teach you about that as well. Um, I'm going to give you a small idea of it. And uh, what do other chefs do with this ingredient? Timmins isn't the only one to cook with blueberries, so I'm going to tell you what the culinary world is doing. And then, uh, you're so smart, and I'm pretty sure you cook with a lot of these ingredients as well, so I thought, let's, uh, let's do a group discussion, and maybe you can share what uh, your cuisine is. Right. So what do I know? Well, excuse me. I moved to Timmins when I was eight. Um, I went to Canada College. My beautiful daughter Lily is right over there with a bright smile. I've had uh, a previous job before this. Before I opened D-Chef, I was an environmental technician. And I used to drive the engineers and all the other scientists nuts because I'd be like, oh, look at that. You can eat that. And I'd be excited. Um, in my volunteer work, I'm with the Sea Cadets. And I've done girl guides. And I love working with the Anti-Hunger Coalition. And I have so many friends, farmers, and neighbors, and this is one of our volunteer works that we did with the uh, Red Cross. Lily and I won the disaster challenge, so we knew how to cook with canned foods. So that was great. So this is just a glimpse. My father, he drove the tanks. I was born in New Brunswick. Here I am with the girls and girl guides. I was the only one sent to BC from Timmins to learn how to cook on a ship. So they sent me to cookery course for six weeks, and. I got to cook for a crew of 20 and bring that back here to Timmins. I graduated from Timmins High, and there's our nice little garden at the community garden. Lily got a whole bunch of carrots there. So, cooking techniques. When you grab, um, when you go to purchase any of the meats, if you've grown your vegetables, uh, if you foraged for something, you're going, now what do I do? Well, in the techniques, we've got in the dry section, uh, bake, broil, deep fry, double broil, uh, broiler, pan fry, saute, sweat, and torch. Torch is fun. It's the, that's where you can take the top of your uh, ingredients and give it that nice sear on top. If you don't have a broiler, some of the culinary uh, kitchens, the high kitchens, they have a salamander that we would put on for that nice bubble. If you're going to sweat, and this is the difference between sweating and sautéing, frying, is you're taking your vegetables, adding an oil, and you're moving it around the pan at a medium-high heat. When you're on high and you've got uh, fat, you're actually uh, frying it. You're browning it. Sweating it is bringing out that um, uh, inner uh, moisture and uh, letting all of what's in the pan metal together. A uh, sauté is uh, very close to the sweat, except you're going to bring it a little further with the brown. Pan fried, like I had just explained. Double boiler, that's when you have a pot of boiling water, and then you would have a bowl or a second uh, pot on top. That helps us, uh, so you would do a sauce. Hollandaise, for instance. That's where the eggs don't burn, but you can have your eggs separate. So we want to keep that boiling water underneath at um, a simmer. You'll bring it up to a boil and then bring it back down to a simmer. That's so that uh, it doesn't get burnt. You can make a nice sauce that way. Deep frying, that's when you're emerging into fat. So you're getting a fast fry on the outside of your uh, ingredient, and the inside should be tender and... Um, moist inside. Broil grill, that's at a high heat with charcoal or with gas. And then bake. Difference between bake and roast, and sometimes that we do different at home, is that uh, roasting is at a high heat and you get that brown on the outside. We think we're roasting our turkeys when we have it in the oven, but really we're sometimes boiling it because it's covered in water, or uh, we're really just baking it. We don't have that constant heat around the meat or vegetable that we're uh, roasting. And then we've got moist heat. Blanch, boil, braise, poach, scald, simmer, and steam. 
I'm going to put this all on my Facebook if you want to receipt. Uh, in your, uh, your recipes, well, what is simmering? Maybe I'm not doing this right. Maybe I should remember that uh, I'm not bringing it up to a boil. I'll be changing uh, how that ingredient is going to taste. Simmer is letting it stay, come all together, make a great flavor. If I'm bringing it to a boil, I'm going to continuously bring that temperature up higher and changing how that ingredient is. If I'm braising, it's got a liquid. I don't have that top on, and I've got this liquid that's reducing and, and all of the ingredients all together, like osuguko. I do that a lot with my uh, clients, chicken osuguko. That's when you're going to take a uh, tough meat, make it tender, and it's normally for a long period of time. And same with blanche and boil. What's the difference? Well, blanche is a quick into boiling water. Boil is where it's going to stay. I boil a potato and I'm going to make it tender on the inside. Whereas blanching, I'm going to take my vegetables from the garden and I'm going to do a quick blanch so that they're not fully cooked. I can reserve them for the next time if I decide to freeze them or put them in my refrigerator. So here I've got a cheat sheet on how long do we cook our vegetables for. Uh, if we're boiling steam or microwave, you can now go back to that description and use any one of these for your vegetables. You're not, you're not stuck with just boiling and steaming, right? Sometimes that can be boring. We don't add anything to it, or we might boil that poor piece of asparagus to be something limp and no color. So where do we go from that? There's so many choices. I kind of like to um, say that when I go into a kitchen and I see all of these ingredients in my customer's fridge, I go, okay, I've got a piece of meat here, I've got chicken, I can either do that slow and long, or I can do something fast and make sure it's moist on the inside. So it depends on what you're picking. So from here I can do my dry or fast, slow and dry, moist, I'll put this again on my Facebook but let's take an ingredient. Anybody, something that you would normally pick. What's your favorite? Shout it out. Potatoes. Potatoes. Great. So I can boil, simmer, steam, or poach. And this is for tender cuts, it says here for me. But this is for vegetables, too. Think about something that would be tender in your garden. Like the asparagus. You know, it says vegetables there, but... You gotta, you gotta think, what kind of vegetable or forage piece did I get? What is it like? What can complement it? What will bring out the best flavors? For me, my personal favorite is, uh, I always roast it. It's bringing the sugars, the natural sugars out. Brown is yummy, and it's, it's just, I think, making the vegetable a star. So if I wanted to braise some carrots in a, a wine sauce with some butter and add some rosemary, you know, that's, I'm just thinking of the ingredient and moving from there. Just making myself salivate beforehand, sometimes I'll cook for my clients and I'll be like, ooh, I could have eaten all of that. And I know I've given them something that I would be very happy. You know, I put that TLC in. And that's the same for you, working it up, saying, oh, those mushrooms would be fantastic with um, some radishes that are crunchy, you know, and I've got that woody mushroom. you got to think of what the combinations can be. So I said, what's the flavor? What complements this? What kind of herbs, spices will partner well? And how do I cook it? So you're looking at the ingredient, and you're thinking in your web, what, what's going to go along with it? So, and even in your complement, you know, your second ingredient or your herb, you've got a whole bunch of other choices. Do I have dried herbs? Do I have fresh herbs? Am I going to ruin what complements it with the main ingredients? So you've got to take some TLC into that as well. Um, if I put in butter in the pan... Is it going to brown and darken and make it worse? Getting to understand your ingredients is, is the best thing that you can do. Um, 
So let's, let's start from the beginning. We've gone from potatoes. And I want the potatoes to be the star ingredient. So a typical thing that you see on the menu, bacon, cheese, potatoes. I don't really want the cheese. I really want to taste the potatoes, so I'm going to put in a little bit of bacon. Well, I think I want to add some more flavor. I found some chives. I found some chives that are flowering beside my house. The color and the green are going to be so nice at the end when I finish frying my potatoes because I want that brown off of the bacon and off of the potatoes. There's the starch that's going to give it that flavor. And then the steam from that is going to bring out the chives and the purple. And when I look at it, the composite of the plate, I'm now salivating and I put in a lot of love and care and thought through the whole procedure. How do you do this? I know this. I know how this is all going to work. Well, we know this through recipe. We know this through friends. We know it through online cooking. I was saying earlier I love technology and I think it's one of the greatest things. You see every morning, not because I'm a chef and I like seeing all these things, but I see a video on Facebook and it's just amazing. They're telling us how to cook a white sauce which is the foundation to other sauces in the culinary world. You're going to learn this the same as doctors, and it's a practice. Your cooking life is a practice. I'm only going to know that the chicken tastes horrible, barbecued for an hour on hives, because I've now got a dry piece of junk that will be forever in the back of my mind. I'll know to bring down the heat, to maybe not put it on direct heat, and um, add a sauce, right? Maybe I'm going to change grilling altogether, and now I'm going to bake it. So please experiment. Take whatever you foraged, grew, and try to experiment. Don't be afraid. And this goes to even some of the um, shows that I've seen. I didn't even know that these, these flavors could exist together. and They just become new favorites. So what are the common vegetables and meats? So we've got, and these are all pictures that I took over the summer. Uh, we've got potatoes and beets. This is from JK Gardens. I believe it's the same from JK Gardens. We've got more beets, aren't they beautiful? Beets are my favorite. And we've got some uh, rainbow char. Green tomatoes and red tomatoes, they're both good. So that's a thought in, in right there. Am I picking um, the vegetables too soon or do I let them mature later? Sometimes um, uh, an early crop, you can do something with that too. If you feel it's about to go south and it's not going to grow any better or Maybe some bugs got to it. You can grab it before the bugs get it. What can I do with that um, immature crop? This is really big. We've got um, spaghetti squash and some acorn and butternut and then the butternut and the pu pumpkin. Everybody thinks that they should just carve it. It's so good roasted and it has the sugars in there. Something you can do with squash is exchange that for a cream sauce. Mother Nature helped you make a cream sauce, which we would have had to do was make a roux, which is butter and flour, and we would have to cook it and then add milk, and then we would have to add some flavoring, some onions. Whereas if I steamed that butternut squash and I pureed it, and added a little cream. I now have a creamy sauce for my pasta. If I took the pumpkin, I added some maple syrup and I added some cinnamon. I've now got a dip for my daughter. She can dip her fruits in pie. Or her apples or pie. She's yelling pie. That's great. <laughs> So here's our flavorings, and still they can be the star attraction. We've got garlic. Garlic is great. And when you buy it, 
You can actually, instead of cook with it, you can grow it. Ask, ask friends how to grow it. I'm not a farmer. I talk to farmers and I make farmers my friends. And they show me new ingredients, which is just great. And then they show me things like purple peppers. Or people like twigs. They, uh, together we grow and inspire. They've got the beds downtown. And um, I was just, I was grabbing lemongrass and some basil one day. And I went to the sushi shop and I decided to put all those herbs in my miso soup. So now I've got something local and I enhanced something that was cheap in, in my budget for, I think it's three dollars. You've got some hot spicy to make your own salsa. There's salsas on here. All the ingredients. They'll tell you which one's hot because their fingers probably burnt if they went like this. People hate kale. <laughs> But it's so big, and it's become a new trend for the health fanatics and kale chips. But if you cut it up and you braise it with your meat, if, and you know the South, they've got collard greens, and they knew how to add a lot of fat and pork and onions, and they, they would uh, saute it for a long time, and they knew when it broke down and it was added with something else, it would taste flavorful. But you can add it with a tomato sauce. Today, uh, for a client, I had chicken breast, turkey bacon, and they had some extra kale. So I decided to cut that up, and I baked that with a tomato sauce and added a pizza spice. Beans. We've got purple beans over here. You can do your own pickling at home or make your own slaw with the beans. You can uh, definitely add a cheese sauce. You can put it in a stew. You can make a bean salad. A bean pie. Fruit. Do we have fruit? Yeah, we've got some uh, crab apples. Hibiscus. This was somebody's birthday treat this past, uh, just recently. So we've got blueberries, raspberries, and field strawberries. They're pretty small. You're not going to get a huge blue, uh, uh, berry pie, unless you spent uh, a good time or you're a good picker, but they're there. Lily, what are these? Do you remember picking these? What are they? No? Cranberries? A doctor showed us this, and when we were going with kids, um, they said, look for little rubies. It was in a swamp area. And so now I can make muffins, and I can make cranberry sauce, and I've also cooked liver. Somebody hated liver and onions, so I added uh, cranberries with uh, herbs, rosemary and thyme and sage, and that masked it really well. And pin cherries. Jerusalem hearts, sunchokes, that's the flower. Lobster mushrooms. I got to use these at a competition, and I'll tell you about them later. Hazelnuts. Chanterelles. And our meat. I was going to show you the raw meat, but I decided to show you the animal. It kind of makes it a little more in the humane. Apologies. So we've got beef, we've got chicken, we've got pigs, we've got turkey. And uh, the biggest... One of the farmers, one of my biggest uh, adventures this year, and I'm really thankful for it, is that um, I was going to make a rabbit stew. And I talked to the farmer to ask them, do you have any rabbits that I could use? He goes, oh, I think they're a little small. How's about you come to the farm? And I had to go to the farm and feel the meat and see if they were ready or not. Feeling that warm animal... Um, kind of gave me a first hand, like, ooh, this is important, and how are they being cared for? And I have to say, I really appreciate the farmers around here, because I see how the animals are raised. It makes me more conscious in how much meat that I'm going to give to my clients as well, and portion sizes, and makes me aware in my home as well. So here's something that you can do with the vegetables. This is a tart, a galette, you can call. 
you want to make something really important to you, you try and find out what the culinary term is. If, uh, if you can find, I would say it's a pie, right? But I've now just said it's a galette. So we've got some zucchinis in here, some tomatoes. Some other things you can use is mushrooms. You can definitely do carrot. What would I do to enhance that? I would want to add some feta cheese or some goat's cheese and then add some fresh herbs. Maybe drizzle it with birch syrup, which is something that's local. The culinary world is really good at decorating a plate. Your composite plate is made of different, different parts. So what am I going to do to every ingredient to give it that extra enhancement? I kind of see under here some meat. So it could be a poached piece of fish or perhaps a tenderloin. We've got our tomatoes, some sprouts, some tarragon I kind of see in here. This looks like a pepper. Mustard seeds, that's something local, making a mustard sauce. I can just imagine those bursting in my mouth, giving it that spice, that heat. Maybe they're pickled. These can be beets. Taking uh, the cut of the beet greens, the stems, cutting them on an angle. I can put that on top. What kind of components can I add to my salad? What kind of depth, layer, color, and flavor can I add to my plate? The only way you're going to also know this is when you go to pick. Take that carrot, wash it off, and eat it. Take that stem, try it. Ask friends, what do you think about this? What, you grew that in your garden, what's that like? Well, here. And some of the farmers will do that to you too. Want a bite? That's great. Well, this was mine. So this is cucumbers. I had some sprouted live greens, and I took some red onions and pickled them. And all I did was put it on the plate. I fanned it out. Then I put my greens in the center. The um, red onions, I pickled them. Mm, five minutes. Some sugar, uh, vinegar, and some salt. That's it in an open bowl in my refrigerator. And now you've got um, pickled onions that can go, to, go on a pulled pork sandwich. Uh, I can add that on an appetizer, maybe some hummus. It's now giving a sour uh, and strong onion flavor for me. These are pomelos. We could switch that out for some berries. One time when I was doing the urban um, market, um, I would go every week and I'd give recipes. I asked the farmers first what they were going to have, and then I'd have a recipe ready for the customers walking through. And you can actually make fish tacos sometimes because we've got cabbage, we might catch our own fish, we have some flour from Posh Haven Farms, which comes from uh, the New Liskard area, so I can make my own tortillas. Tortillas are just flour, water, and a little bit of oil. You mix it all together, make a mass dough, let it sit for a while so the elasticity comes, roll it up, and fry it on both sides. That's it. That's a tortilla. So simple and easy and cheap. Other things that I could add is, uh, to the slaw is some of the other hard vegetables. Or maybe I can thinly slice some carrots or thinly slice some beets. And I can add that in. And then I can make my own sauces with those peppers or with your uh, herbs. Just put them all together with some oil. You can either, uh, just like a mortar and pestle, pinch them all together. Or you can uh, put them in your blender. This is what you're going to spend. <laughs> hundred dollars for. <laughs> so I see a beet, which we grow really well. I see some clover. This could be a parsnip, some edible flowers. Maybe I did a reduction of red beets 
or added the um, the birch syrup. This could be a foam. You can take your horseradish and make a foam. Gives it that airy, light, spicy feel. This could be a piece of fish. I see it crusted with something. Maybe again the mustard. And then uh, that can be the purple chives. So what they've done is they've got the component here. Maybe they've roasted or marinated the um, a parsnip. And then they just add the color all around. And just drizzled that sauce. Kind of looks like a painting on the plate. Again in the fish, taking a piece of fish, treating it with the biggest respect, the most love, so much flavor. They probably poached this. No, fried it. And then added a little bit more of the herbs. And here again, you can have a foam or make sort of like a gazpacho, you know, with your cucumbers that you have in your garden. It can even be a vegetable broth if you've juiced it. And here we've got oil. And it's just pureeing and adding flavor. Okay. Uh, this is a gordita. This is from Chuck Hughes. Anybody heard of Chuck Hughes? Chuck stays off. He's a Quebec chef. So we've got some thin sliced radish, we've got some peppers, we can take some pork, pork belly, and then they've added some greens. And this is a fried bread. So I went to the Toronto Food and Wine Festival, and I got to talk to all of these great chefs. David Rocco, he's on, uh, on the Food Network, he's got a wine. But what's really great about watching him and what he likes to show is Italian dishes. And he would go into Italy and he would pick and forage these, these vegetables or something that the farmer or the truffle pigs would go and find. And then he would go back to his fancy Italian apartment and make this wonderful dish that's so simple. But he knew how to just highlight what he picked that day. That's Chuck Hughes. Roger Mooking, he likes a lot of the uh, uh, Asian cuisine. This is what I got to do at the competition. Uh, it was at the Miele Kitchen. I got to go against some people that were on Master Chef and Chop Canada, some winners. It was pretty intense what they made. So I decided to bring some foraged hazelnuts, which this guy really loved. They thought it was great, and I said, Timmins has awesome food. I, you wouldn't believe what grows there. We've got mushrooms that are just nuts. And I took the Thornwell blue cheese and I made a hashtag out of it. And this is uh, greens from Radical Gardens. So I got to feed a bunch of celebrities some really awesome food from Timmins. This is uh, Martin Picard. He's from uh, Quebec. And he's got a couple of restaurants, and he's that French tradition, the same uh, heritage as us. And he knows how to take the pig, how to take the animal, and how to take the forged food and make these great stews. He used to take every part of the mousse. And uh, he'd, take, he'd take the testicles and slightly <laughs> cut them, and then fry them in some butter and add this amazing sauce with some foraged, uh, some foraged greens. This is Curtis Stone here. So I got to sit at his show and I'm like, okay, let's see what the Australian has to tell me. He took um, tomatoes and what you see here is a dehydrator. He took the tomatoes, he blended it, then he strained it, and had this beautiful tomato broth. And you would think that he'd make a soup next, or like a drink. But instead what he did it is he added a starch, and he put it on the dehydrator, which then made these thin little clear sheets. And then he deep fried it. And he made tomato broth, essence of tomato broth, chips. He knew how to manipulate the 
ingredient, which we grow here in Timmins, right? Tomatoes. And he made this really awesome chip. And there wasn't any chemical enhancement. It was right in front of my eyes, an oil uh, with the starch, and he just made that broth. Anybody want to share what they do with their favorite ingredient? What do you make, Lily? Um, bacon and eggs. You make bacon and eggs? I make your omelet. You make my omelets in the morning, that's right. I have a personal chef in the morning. And we get those eggs from... Are those eggs from the farm? Yeah? Who's farm? Uh, those eggs... Is from Carla's Trust Street? Yeah, we get those ones from uh, our friend Cara from the Mennonites. And we also get some from Rosalia we've had before, and we've had some from Hot Feather Farms before. Yeah, we've been there. Lois. Uh. Her best friend. And you can get your bacon, you can get it from Hawk Feather Farms, and you can get it at Next Step Disciple Farms, um, Esposito. Anybody else? No? I really like adding spinach to everything. It's like a nice replacement for maybe lettuce if you're looking for something that has more nutrients in it. Yeah. So I like adding it to sandwiches or my pastas, and I even like put them in my, like just a little bit in my smoothies in the morning, and you don't taste it, but you get the extra Right. I've seen it in chips. I really like, actually, kale spinach chips. And you can make that, too. Uh, again, but the, um, the corn flour isn't from Timmins, but I am introducing local into it, right? And honestly, I feel that Timmins flavor. It's not... Where I am and the closest that I picked it, I find is just, like, first of all, I'm proud of myself. And then second, I, I just think that it's the best flavor right now. One time I made a steak, and the steak came from Metogamy Heights Farm. And then I had honey horseradish sauce from the bees and berries. I said, you know what? This is the best flavor ever, and nobody else is having this in the world. This is my own unique dish, and nobody else has it. When you go to grow and pick and make your own dish, nobody else in the world is eating that. Because you picked it, you grew it, you found it, and then you made this beautiful plate. And not only are you so proud that you did that, you know, it tastes so much better. There's a, a real big mental part in it. Are there any vegetables or cooking questions you have for me? Yes, Lily. I heard... I forget how to make the smoothie. The smoothie we made? It's hard to make. It is hard to make. Okay, so we take our strawberries from the, <laughs> the summertime, and we've actually been having strawberry milkshakes every morning. So we took the strawberries that we had in the summer and that are in our, our uh, freezer, and Lily likes to add that with milk and yogurt and some vanilla. Oh, and your favorite ingredient, honey, right? She loves local honey. And she has allergies, so that honey is helping her. I've never had a beet that wasn't like pickled beets. How would you... For beets? Beet is a side. Oh, I didn't tell you. I'm intrigued. So, when I was at the Toronto Food and Wine, they had um, vegan goat cheese, which was a fermented um, nut, and made it into a cheese. And then they add smoked beets and put it on a crostini, which is my new favorite flavor, smoked beets. So you can either get a smoked tea, I get it at uh, David's Tea, Lap Song Star Chang, as it's called, or you can get some hickory smoke in a jar. Uh, I like to poach my beets, uh, and then you would take off the, uh, the skin, thinly slice it, and put that on top of some goat's cheese. There's something about the two flavors that are Awesome, awesome, awesome. Beets are great raw. Have it raw. And beets are not just purple. Um, there's the candy stripe, which is our favorite. And just the other day, I did a beets Napoleon, again with the, the goat's cheese. And uh, what I did is I 
I had taken off the skin, sliced it, poached it in some apple cider vinegar, chilled it, and then I went beets, goat's cheese, beets, goat's cheese, and it was just this tall tower. Um, you can barbecue them. I used to do lollipops with uh, sweet potatoes and beets. I put them on a stick and I would just barbecue it and make my own ranch dressing, which you can do with the herbs that we grow and you can find wild. Now put that in some uh, sour cream and you dip it in. Beets are great roasted, just a little bit of uh, salt and olive oil. I did that in college actually. It's on the uh, Golden Beef, yeah, Golden Beef uh, website. There, um, that, that sells at DeBrows. <laughs> DeBrowski's is really good, really good. That's a jewel. Is there any other um, vegetable that you grow that you would like to know? Other than How would you make rabbit? For rabbit? Mm -hmm. So you can braise that in the Asabuco style. Um, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough, it can be a tough meat if it's been cooked too much to be chewy. Um, so having it in a sauce, maybe with some onions, some tomatoes, add some olives if you'd like, and uh, let that go into the oven at 325, probably for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And uh, you'll have something that's tender, nice to break apart, and a beautiful sauce. And, that what's around it will infuse into it because it's not really a distinctive flavor. No, it's very tender. But you said, do you put in what? In tomato sauce. Tomato sauce and did you add the onions and garlic? Or? Yeah, and you can add a splash of wine if you want. <coughs> you don't marinate it ahead of time or anything like that? You, you can know? marinate it, grill it, and do lemon juice or something like that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Just again, remember if you... Um, if you uh, overdo it, it can be like that chewy piece that... I like all that with some squids, so I'm looking <laughs> There you go. The uh, purple peppers or purple peas, what do they taste like? Are they different than the... Um, the purple pepper I didn't try, um, but I would assume it's pretty close. That's a question for the farmers. That's a really great thing. Um, when you go up and you... What's this? Mm -hmm. What's it like? Sometimes uh, they'll let you have... So there's a big variance between you and know, Right. Pepper, and then I wonder if that's in, that's the, in the sweetness, right? Yeah. Now I'm going to have to try it this summer, and I will definitely post it. I see. Yeah. yeah. Did you try the peas as well? Or? The purple one? Yeah. The purple beans? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really like those. I didn't see a difference in taste, mm. um, but I really like that dark color. Yeah. I don't know if it was like an antioxidant kind of idea in the back of my head. Um, but... What did I do with that? I did garlic, olive oil, and uh, vinegar. That's it. And you can uh, blanch that, or you can just have it straight washed and crunchy. Mm -hmm. What about the bolis or the chanterelles? Oh, I would, I would want, I would want to fry those to get that nice brown. Um, if you put them in the oven. I would put that with a sauce, but they have such a great, dense, woodsy flavor in them, nutty, that uh, that's what I normally do. I, I'll uh, slice them and then add some cream and just put it on top of plain pasta. I don't want to pair it with anything else because I kind of treat mushrooms like a meat, just because they have that great flavor to them, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to add anything else. I probably wouldn't even add a really harsh onion. You'd want like a shallot maybe to give that small bit. And the same with garlic. I'd be careful at too much just because it's it's so great and, and it's hard to find. Like unless you're really good at finding them or I have a really good friend that picks a whole bunch of them. I would I would want to taste it. Make it make it the star attraction. When you when you uh, fry them you, you normally uh Take the water out of them first, like fire, fire the water out of them first? Or? Uh, yeah, that, like that, that's what will, the water comes out, the sugars come out, and that's what browns in the pan. Mm -hmm. and is that the same thing with the lobsters? Or? With the lobsters, that's a, a really cool one. Um, 
And again, they made it the star attraction. When I went to the Foie Gaumain, a lot of people were making it into, and, and I've done this too, mushroom pâté. So uh, you uh, fry them, and then you, what you would do is process it. So it would be that spreadable kind of idea. You put it on a piece of toast, and then you would, you would taste that lobster mushroom. And they didn't add any extra spices to it either, or onions. It was just great. Uh, you could add chicken broth. I wouldn't add a beef broth. I'd add a light broth to it. So maybe this is where um, something that isn't too fishy would go great with it. Go ahead, Lily. Do you have any other questions? What's the, um, some more ideas with turnip and parsnip? The turnips and parsnips. We all do stew, right? But uh, cube it, roast it. You're going to get that individual flavor. Um, you can add, make your own kind of um, root vegetable like ratatouille kind of idea. You can have them in slices uh, or small dice and you can saute them or add some butter, put it in the oven and bake it. Uh, I would suggest that. Adding um, savory, thyme, uh, the chives at the end, rosemary, those would go great with it. And cheese. Okay, it is great. How do you attack, I always have problems attacking your rutabaga because it's covered in wax. Right. And you need like a, I don't know, an axe to cut it up or whatever, especially the bigger it is, the tougher it is. So when in cutting, and my apologies, because uh, I went to school for two years to learn um, my cooking techniques, right? So I'm not going to teach you everything in one night, but definitely take classes. And uh, knife skills are, are where... Um, it's a class. <laughs> so you want, you don't want something fumbling, okay? You want to have, like, a flat, so that when you go to cut it, it's not going to move around. Mm -hmm. And then your knife. Make sure it's not dull. That's where we cut ourselves, because uh, we're forcing. Don't hack, because your hand could be in the way. Uh, just start off with the tip, and then bring it down. Don't, don't take more than what you can handle, for sure. Uh, no need to saw and get like a hacksaw or mm -hmm. your bread knives. Just a sharp six inch knife is great. And of course, you know, if you have something large and you have a small knife, you know, you're not going to handle it. There's got to be some, uh, some common sense in that, mm -hmm. that, uh, oh, my thumb might be in a way. Oh, something well, else. So you're, I find that, that, uh, the wax, I, I really don't know why you put that wax saw on the rubric because on the turn that they don't put it and it doesn't dry out. Fast, so it's, it's one of it's one of the processing that try to keep it fresh. Your mm -hmm. apple has wax on it. Um, a few coats good for what I have in On the apples, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. It's just the if you've ever heard of the grapple, uh, it's a Fuji apple that tastes like a grape, <laughs> and it. This could be incorrect, this could be, you know, the media. But what one article that I read was that the reason the grapple came out was because of the pesticides that were being sprayed on the apples. Mm -hmm. They were finding that the apples tasted like grapes. So then they said, well, maybe we can sell this. So they say that they're uh, submerging it in Concord grape juice and that now they've made a hybrid apple. Uh, I don't know. Not my thing. Our, our wheat is not the same as what the ancient grains used to be it's either. So we've, yeah, we we've we've made, made that, you know. So, uh, what you can grow though, what you can make and what the farmers got, you know. But those are seeds which are so by Monsanto or whatever. Right? Yeah. So it's like, it's already GMO seeds. So, uh, but you cut some of the process out, right? And there's another part in that too, the recall in, in vegetables that you've seen recently, um, uh, the farmers have to take care of that, you know, there's the food inspection, they need to make sure where the vegetables are grown, what processing plant, what kind of water it's been washed in, you know, and when it's mass produced and it's going all over the globe, you know, please check in. Well, but you can definitely walk onto a farmer's, you know, farm here and say, how's your day? 
how's those carrots growing? And they actually will show you about 20 more, and I don't want to hurt their feelings because i got to leave. But I love them so much because they've got something cool around the corner or growing in a new hot house that we have because they've got orange carrots and they've got what, uh, beet, uh, purple. Beet, purple carrots and, uh, and yellow carrots, and I'm like, yeah. oh, what is this, another hybrid or what? That's not my that's not yeah. my area. Okay. One last question. Yeah. Uh, squid. Uh, when you buy it, like the rings in the frozen thing, you, what do you? What's the best way to cook those? Coated and fried. Oh. I mean, it's not. Uh, but you thaw it out first, and then yeah. under cold water or just room temperature in the fridge for the overnight or whatever. No, don't do. Do not place meat on the counter overnight. It's always the fridge. Overnight. Yeah, in the refrigerator, you want to make sure that your refrigerator is always colder than four degrees. Yeah. And if you're going to do something fast, which you can do with the fish, you can pour cold water over it for a few minutes, and then it will thaw. Uh, pat it dry. Make sure it's dry. Uh, season it, and then fry. And uh, seasoning can sometimes have a breading on it: potato starch or you know flour. Oh, okay. Do you have a list of local farmers and suppliers that you, uh, that you use, or is it some on your website? Well, I don't show my preferences. No. Uh, I don't really have a really large, like... There are eight farmers here in town, so... Yeah, and you can check it at uh, Taste of Timmins. They've got a list of it. And I just heard of a new one, Acres. Well, it's not new, but it's on Mahoney Road. I, I, uh, Acres of Dreams. It, thank you. That's where we should. Yeah, that's where we kind of get our eggs and our beef from. That's where we get the meat. I saw a post on Facebook, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I saw they had some freezer or, stuff. Yeah, yeah and uh, if you see on the, the Taste of Timmins, you'll see some uh, descriptions of them. Um, and I tried to link them where I got my meat or what's included. Uh, yeah. Was there some chickens there too? Or? Chickens too, yeah. Pork, beef. Yeah. And the price of their organic or they're not organic? Or um, well, they're not certified organic, okay. but they don't use any chemicals. Yeah, so the, the only certified are the, the Mennonites, I believe, at this moment, well, one of the farmers. Yeah. And, um... Brianna like, is aiming for it, so... Yeah, and there's, like, there's some debate on, like, uh, some of them have debates on what's certified right. or not. Uh, again, not my place to go. Mm -hmm. You just... You give me that, and it's really, from my point, it's your your um, option. Mm -hmm. You know, it's up for you to know and what what you want personally, and you, what your pocketbook, what you socially want to put in. I'm not your conscience. I'm just telling you how to cook it. And uh, you cook here in town? I am a personal chef, so I go into oh. the homes and I cook for people, and then I do classes as well as uh, I do some catering. I'll get to you later, sweetheart. <laughs> go play. Go play. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's best for the farmers to speak for themselves. Right. Um, what I can say is that they have great products. Well, they do show up at the farmer's market, at least they have been. So. Yeah. So. And uh, Next Step as well has pork, beef, and uh, they're in South Pork Pine. And they show their promotion. I, I mean, um, our communication, well, at least... The biggest presence for me is uh, Facebook. People trying to get it out there so much. Um, my family has another business, and people say to us, well, where did you post this? Or where where are you telling people? And it's so hard. Um, yeah, but if somebody doesn't go on Facebook, uh, yeah. then... Uh, yeah, and, but when you have resource dollars and you're not sh sure where to focus that on, like, there's just so much, because the same with radio, uh, I, it's hard to direct who I'm going to for listeners because... You know, I, did you listen? Anybody listen to CBC today? Yeah. I love DNTO. I, I, I like listening to uh, Sookie and Lee, and today was actually about food. So if you'd like to check out her podcast, she was mm -hmm. talking about food. I was like, wow, well, that's a message about today. Hopefully it goes well. Um, but uh, somebody in Winnipeg was eating for $11 a week. She works for the Commerce, and she's a chef, and they did got together and... They learned uh, making your own pasta, making your own uh, recipes. That was their that was their savior in pricing and uh, knowing how to how to cook was was what was, was great. And you know, if we overcook it, or if we put the wrong compliment, or if you know we're not doing something right, we're not going to like it, right? 
we put in love and know how to cook it and what to put it with, what's its great partner, a uh, great marriage, you know? And we'll continue to eat local and have that love for it. I look forward to taking this in classes because I grew up in a meat and potatoes household, so my, my cook was not very bad. <laughs> uh, my, my, my personal favorites, and I like to share with everybody, is a giant bowl of roasted vegetables with just like barley. That, like, it's just so great. Uh, even this morning, or for lunch, sorry, I had a bowl full of uh, cucumber, I had some avocado, and I had some tomato, and... Uh, Mix it all together, and that was my lunch. Because I cut it up and I added these great little flavors to it, and I think uh, everybody needs like a chef beside them. Where I was the kid that was invited for dinners. Is uh, could you invite Diane over? And I'd be eating whatever the kids didn't want. And I'm like, oh, she's eating it too. I might eat it. Do you have a business card? Or? I've got some business cards and some um, pamphlets for you when you go. Anything else? When you talked about the roasting, really, what you talked about, how big of pieces would you cut them into? When roasting, you want to keep them in uni uh, uniform size because if you have a big one and a small one, they're not going to cook evenly. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have large rounds if you wanted to, or you could have small cubes. Or uh, I would definitely not mince. Right? Yeah, raw is great. Oh, and sticks and on your vegetable tray, that's great. Mm -hmm. But for the roasting, I would keep them all uniform size. And it just depends, right? If they're really big, then it's longer. It's the same with boiling potatoes, right? If you had small cubes, they would cook faster, larger. Um, but you may, as they get larger, might burn. Yeah, because I usually boil them with potatoes or with the turnips. Or turnips with potatoes or Carrots. I've seen carrots and rutabagas. That was what growing up because they wanted to take away the bitter when you boil it. Well, a, a lady which I knew for, uh, her kids didn't like veggies, so she put in celery, carrots, potatoes, two other ingredients, and she mashed it up. Mm -hmm. and she called it uh, orange potatoes. Mm -hmm. the kids, her kids loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He said, well, give us more orange potatoes. Because sometimes that one ingredient might be overpowering, right? So we want something to mellow it out or, you know, just to highlight each other. That can happen. Because goat cheese alone, right, would be, like, yummy, right? But then I've added smoked beets, and you're like, oh, smooth and smoky and got that earthy beet taste to it, Right? kind of like wine. And that's the same thing I do with wine and beer. So you have to close your eyes and go, what am I tasting? I kind of get a skunky feel out of this. Or, <laughs> you know, you're putting a, a thought into your taste. And what do I want to match with that? Right? Citrusy. Because obviously, like, the uh, sour crab apples, right? We're going to go, ooh. But there's something nice behind it. Maybe if I mellowed it with maple syrup, and then there's that smoky maple with it too, right? Crab the jelly. Yeah. But we've, we've, crab, we've put sugar right to get rid of that. What are some of the things you can do with pinch I, I wanted to ask that when I saw the picture of it. Uh, I've, heard of like like yeah, I've heard of jam. Yeah, I've heard of jam. I've heard, and um, you can do a sauce. Um, with meats, with the uh, roasted meats, that'd be great. I bought jelly at the farmer's market. It was the jelly made out of it. Yeah. It was and a small container. Yeah. Quarter of a 250. You can put your you berries, and a recent one I did was blueberries uh, with maple syrup on top of salmon. Mm. So baking your cherries with the, you know, that wild berry taste with your roasted meats is really nice. That's a compliment. For sure. So you can bake the thin cherries with... On if top you of the roast meat. Uh, a meat or something. Yeah. Just put it right on top. And yeah. Yeah. And here's an another one. Wood. Right? We've got wood. If it was smoked or, you know, we have cedar planks, right? You put your fish on it. You put it around it. Right? 
just be careful what kind of wood you put. You want to understand your ingredients. Again, the same with foraging. You want to understand your ingredients and that they're not toxic, especially in the way that you cook them before you pick those forage. Grab a foraging friend. That's no, because if you're doing wood, you put it in, keep it in water for a number of hours before you put it in the oven with the amino on top, right? Or whatever. No. So you're soaking your wood so it doesn't catch on fire mm -hmm. um, on the grills or if it was on its pan on its mm -hmm. own uh, when you're smoking because uh, we don't want that flame, right? We just want that smoke. So that's what the, the submerging is for. But if there's already a liquid with it, like say the plank, the wood is in there, it's already got a liquid, so um, it would it'd probably absorb the extra liquid. Or it could expel like uh, sap out of those, those woods, so that's the other part knowledge of that wood, but that's what the soaking is for. And it doesn't necessarily have to be water. It can be um, beer or wine or um, this, the, like, the syrups, you know, you can add extra that. Or you could have uh, a stock of some sort, right? And that's a good one too. You can, um, you can burn like uh, herbs and, and, and things like that. And uh, just put the pot on top, and that kind of has a smoke on the outside. Don't do it too long, and now you've kind of got a smoke like rosemary over top of a meat. That's an enhancement. So take the ingredient, read up on it, ask a friend, find a recipe, kind of get the idea of what the cooking process is and how can you alter it. What path can you go down with it? Can I try it this way? Deep frying a beet, for instance. Understanding that. Don't do that. It's full of water. Be careful of that. You'll have a uh, something explode. So you want to, can I deep fry a beet? Google's great for that. Can I do this? And then here, community discussion. Because sometimes they're not available. Don't listen to one article. Listen to a community discussion. I make choke cherry jelly, and a lot of people think the jelly will taste like the berry. But it doesn't. It's great. Yeah. It tastes wonderful. Mm -hmm. But see, see the description you just gave to that ingredient? Like, you know, you've tried it, and, and now you've... Yeah. That's what you do with all of your local ingredients. You, you put it in that uh, recipe, and then it's wonderful. Even with carrot jelly or, you know... You can make beet jelly. Pepper can, jelly. <coughs> jelly anything, right? That's taking a cooking process with that ingredient and making it into something. Now, if you added, some, I don't know, pepper now to that jelly, right? You've got a pepper choke cherry jelly, right? And pepper added jelly coffee. is good with meat. Yeah. yeah. So, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, we've got mint galore and other um, herbs that grow, so, like, Go mint, mint, mint around Gibbons Lake. Yeah. Around lake sugar. So you just go and walk around and say, oh, there's the mint. Yes. I don't know if I've seen that before. It was the it was it was Katrina um, from Twig. We were walking with our daughters. She was foraging, and that's all it took. I'm pretty sure Mark could give you quite some tips as well. <laughs> Where would you find cranberries here in town? We I'm went. Sure <laughs> by we went down by Domtar to pick those. Or yeah, uh, down the, the highway where the Malets was. We went down the logging road and she found it was a marshing area with tamarack. And uh, that's where they were used to picking those. So she said look for the, the tamarack and marsh area and and Sillington has high high bush cranberries. Oh, yeah. Because I picked them there on the moose, moose street. So the next time she goes for a walk, and if she's your friend or you, you see her around, say, could I come for a walk with you? Or you could go on a wilderness tour and for sure mark my stop. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there is that other group, those wild crafters of Timmins and area. Yes. They they have been here a couple times now, and, and uh, the gal who does that, uh, Amy. A Amy, she's really good. And... Uh, and they have uh, lots of good tips for that kind of stuff. So there is a group that does go out now and then and, and, and does exactly this too. Yeah. So why I say technology is great, because we've got these great tools to communicate, right? And that's exactly how I found out about cranberries. They're like, we're going in the bush this weekend. Want to come? No, I remember yeah. when, as a 
kid with my dad who went to the bush, and uh, this was elsewhere in, the, in Quebec, and we picked cranberries, and you have to have high rubber boots for that because you're going, going in the water. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what are some of the other? What are some things that you forage for regularly? Oh, regularly? There's. <laughs> well, blueberries, raspberries. Yeah. My family's fine. I'm the raspberry lover. Lily is the blueberry lover. She has been picking blueberries since she was a baby. She'd be butt naked, full of mosquitoes, picking blueberries. Rose hips. Yeah, rose hips. I don't really forage those very often, no. actually. Mushrooms. Um, horseradish goes all over the time. Yeah, horseradish. Oh, yeah. Rhubarb. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it's people give me rhubarb yet. beer. Um, don't eat the leaves. I get a lot of mushrooms <laughs> for Brianna. She'll sell them, and then somebody will give me like five bags. Look what we found today. Are there any dangerous mushrooms we should look at? Yes, absolutely. You uh, you yeah. you should understand and office. fully know. Don't be yeah. picking um, anything off of the ground until you're a hundred percent sure. Because you can die. Yeah. 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 There's actually a movie. Um, the man went into Alaska and died, and. Um, he actually kept a journal of what he ate, so they kind of figured out what had made him hysteric and have the hallucinations and dehydrated his body and then later made him um, die. It was really, really interesting, but the thing with mushrooms is you have to know the top, the top, the color, then the gills underneath and the stalk and the size. Those are the identifiers and that, that's what a forger. One man was lucky. His name's Brian Jones. He had an Italian that kept going to his door to um, pick the mushrooms off of his front lawn. And that's how he learned about that mushroom. Or he also told me he learned about mint a different way that I learned mint. Mine was with Katrina on the Gillies Lake. But he had mint, but he um, didn't have it in a pot, so it was growing in his yard. But his neighbor kept on calling the weed man to get rid of this weed that was in his yard. But it was mint the whole time. And Brian could have picked it for all of his mojitos. He'd make lovely tea. Yeah. Yeah. The raspberry leaves is good for tea, too. You just ruin like you do leaves tea. Yeah, and wintergreen is good for that. Oh, yeah. I like wintergreen. Yep. Yeah, that's and one that I pick leaves. on a height. Fire weed's another one. Wintergreen is. That's your toothpaste uh, mint. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, go to one of these walks. It's, it's refreshing, and it's, I'll get a, a, some sap have, as well. And then Well, they've had a couple things here at the library and gone around, but we haven't really done, there hasn't been very many uh, walks that have had that on it. We do the Hershey Lake walks. Well, I figured I'd, I'd go for Hershey Lake. Yeah, we sometimes we look at it. Yeah, but the, we had a, a mushroom girl come once to one of those, and that was very good. Mm -hmm. And we always try to get somebody that's a little more knowledgeable. I'm, on, I'm not as knowledgeable. I'm the tree guy, right? So I'm not as knowledgeable on all the plants. But, but there's some trees. There's, there's some tree leaves that we can um, eat, right? Oh, absolutely. Help us get rid of scurvy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they need to do more more of that. Well, if somebody yeah. could be more like, you know, a yeah. local or native or whatever that says, and this is this, and this is that, and this is whatever. Yeah. For a mushroom guy, you gotta find your mushrooms. Don't know. I used to go as a kid with my dad, and uh, I'd always pick it and say, "He says, yeah, there was one which I really knew what it was." So, <laughs> but the rest, I it was a poisonous one and a non-poisonous one, and they kind of like looked alike. Yeah. Chanterelles are quite interesting. Yeah. Usually and more else. When I worked up in, uh, I worked up in the Yukon, and they lose all of their hotel workers whenever there was a fire afterwards is when all the mushrooms would grow, so you get more money picking mushrooms. <laughs> so when there's a fire... Well, that's what happened when we had a big fire here at uh, when Highway 111 and 124. Yeah, number nine. Pretty sure so they were people were going mushroom picking them. Yeah. 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 Really? And the blueberries came out really nice, too. <laughs> this year should be really good for blueberries there again. But... I, sorry, again, on Facebook, when I was looking back, I saw the time date. Because it happened at different parts of the season. And it was September that we picked those cranberries. And uh, they talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, the different uh, times. Like they'll post, oh, I've been seeing them, or oh, this is sprouted. 
it's great that they're able to share that, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of wish we had a community board where we would hear it, but we don't. And where would you find the horse riding Is it everywhere here in town? You know, anywhere in Schumacher, pretty much. Oh, really? Was oh, that yeah. from people's gardens? Uh, at the, it, because it's, it's, um... You can go just about down any laneway in Schumacher and find horse riders. Well, yeah, because it's one of these, uh, yeah. what's it called? The Runners. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same with the asparagus. That's another grower. You wouldn't know by the big flower, but it's asparagus. We have asparagus growing, we have asparagus growing here. Fiddleheads. Be careful on fiddleheads because sometimes uh, you have to watch out for the type of the, the, you have to get the right type of fiddle. Yeah. As long as they're curled, they're good. But once they're on curled, then they're not. Yeah, but there's a different. There's yeah. two different types of ferns. There's, there's one type of fern where where it all branches off. That's that's the bad type of fern, and the, and the good type of fern is the single is the single one. We always that's, pick them that, in that's Schumacher. That's the good fiddle. That's the good fiddle. And there's not very uh, there's not very many of those in, in this part of uh, Ontario. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful. Of I didn't find one all last summer. I have, a, I have a couple of the right. I think it got hot too quick last summer. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have a chance. Perhaps it takes somebody to facilitate to find these friends and to to put on an event. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look you can look it up on the internet. It'll, it'll show you the two different types of ferns. Uh, like the, all the ones we get around here, the ones that all branch off, mm -hmm. and yeah. the other one is the single type of fern. You'll find that mostly, you find that fern mo more in a, you more in a marshy more area. Quebec, I would think, right? The, it's, it's very popular in Quebec. Yeah. 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 I think lots of them, them here in Quebec, but outside no, uh, the water well, tower. <laughs> Listen, and if you <laughs> have the walk, and you live in town, and we have the friends walk, you live here in town? Yeah. And we do High Falls and we do Archie's Rock every year once too, and we can easily combine that. We just need to make sure that these foragers are on the walk. What, what group is it that you walk with? It's called the Wild Crafters. Well, the Wild Crafters are the guys that look, look and do the wild foraging, but uh, with Wintergreen Fund for Conservation, the MRCA, so on their site, we, 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 do, uh, we do four hikes a year we try to do. We do High Falls, Archie's Rock we've done. We do Hersey Lake twice a year, a winter one and a summer one, and we throw in whatever else is interesting that's around. Yeah. We, we do those also, and it's a good group. We've had 40, 50 people up to those things. Okay. But you're right. Uh, we need to have, we need to get a, a one of these wild crafters who are good to come out with us. Yeah. Do they have a Facebook page wild crafters? Yes, they do. Um. Yeah, I'm just trying to, maybe if you could take the Timmins Library or me and, and people that uh, can go there, there for tonight. And, yeah, we'll go I really like community discussions and um, I can, like I said, I can only learn from Mark and from others. And, what else would you do with the horse riders besides just uh, grade it? Horse radish is very good with beets. So, um, I know where you are. I got you. Horse radish and beets. It's very neat. It makes the last thing come out this week. Well, my dad used to do that all the time because we had horse radish in the yard and, 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 and beets. And he'd uh, grate the horse radish and, uh, and make a uh, like, horse radish. With beets, which they sell in the jar at the Rossies, they're aware. Okay. Yeah. They've got them pickled and sliced, is that what well, they've got? It's not pickled and sliced, and my, my father would be creating it, and I said, Dad, why are you crying? He said, Will you do this and see if you don't cry? <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, grating the horseradish. It, yeah. You grate the horseradish, you grate the beets, and you marinate it with, uh, you pickle it, right? Like in the cover and whatever, and then. So there's a spice to it, right? Yeah. And then you've got to be careful about it. The brine probably gets rid of the spice. It's not a root vegetable that you want to eat whole. It's a flavor enhancer. Same as I might want to eat a full salad of basil. My mouth would be just full of the flavor, right? Do you have any classes for the book? It's really, there's so many apps.
avenues to go down in the mm -hmm. food industry. And honestly, Tiddens is above some cities. And uh, I'm trying my best to enhance the There's no question for you to go from Is there some real wealth here in town? Sorrel? I don't know. I've heard of it. I think I've heard of it. Yeah. It's like a like, spinach family, but it, it grows the yin high and then it's you very know, popular in France. You know, they, um, the foragers here need to have more classes, and I think mm -hmm. it also they have uh, an issue of, you know, they don't want to be held liable for this person's, like, sometimes mm -hmm. when a picture goes online, people ask for them to identify it, and mm -hmm. you will not get an answer. It's very good. Yeah. There, and some of the forests are sprayed also, so you can become sick afterwards. Right? Well, that, that, that too, I have to tell you, like, I have a liability on me as well. I can kill someone. Actually, it happens. Restaurants kill people. They've, and they are sil sued millions because there's bacteria, there are allergies, uh, that, you know, incorrect labeling, that uh, it's very scary. So when, when I have to cook and adhere to the Porcupine Health Unit, that's because I need to store, prepare, and make sure that it, it is a safe product because it goes into your bodies, mm -hmm. right? Um, so on the food side, you know, we're a college class. I'm not a doctor that can say, eat this carrot and cure yourself. I can say, eat this carrot and be happy, though. <laughs> and I'm a major part in that. Uh, so I definitely advise you to talk to those people. And, and now that you're asking this, you know, I'm going to go to them and say, can, uh, can we come together and have a, mark, a walk with Mark? And you can tell us what it is, and I can eat it and say, this would go great. But where are the walks advertised? They I've just have a walk it. right now at Hershey. We, we, uh, yeah. We just, oh, where's it advertised? Um, in the time. It was two weeks ago. No, it was, at, it was at Yiggs on the Bulletin Board. Yeah, and the Daily Press had it, and CBC Radio. I'm surprised they the didn't Facebook have it here page. on the Bulletin Board. It, it probably was. I would have shown you that, that their Facebook page, but I, the Internet's not there. They disappeared. I, I thought I saw it here for a split second, but it's like it could disappear somehow. I don't know. Because usually it's in January, and they did in February of this year. Yeah, and so what, the, and, 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 and sorry, I don't want to, but the, 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 we always have it with the SAR, the search and rescue guys. Yes, yes, I know. So it's the same weekend, so it's kind of cool. They get, everybody gets to see their Quancy huts and the fires, and it's a real, it's a, we, had, we had a good 45 people out. Except the, the Hershey, uh, the road wasn't cleared. The road that, and the parking lot wasn't, and it was a, Jam. I heard it was a nightmare. Yeah. Oh. So on the class, do you feel a little more um, inspired to try and to change and to taste what you may not know? Yes. And, I, and I didn't tell you how to do the cooking techniques, but for you to understand that there's multi-techniques and that you should understand how to do it. That's, that's the importance. You should know how to cook. And if you don't know, research. And then obviously not just the internet because there, I've caught myself in the, uh, here in historical cooking um, techniques. You know, are just amazing. I love history food. Thank you, Romans. Yeah, no, they're, they're responsible for stew. You wouldn't even guess it. Anything you wanna, would, would want to know in the future? Do you do cooking classes with the Porcupine Health Unit or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. When they, when, um, <laughs> it's a part of sustainability, you know, and also, uh, I created this for my daughter so I can spend time with her, and uh, this is absolutely a passion and, and great knowledge that I have that I can spread, and I want to be there for my daughter, and so uh, sometimes I have to charge. I give as much as volunteer that I can, but uh, the same with them, they just have limited space. Yep. I try my best. They're all my friends. I communicate the best that I can. <laughs> no bridges, so I try. And if you want them, say, oh, Diane would be great to teach us how to... It was even the um, Wolfman, uh, he was an Aboriginal chef, he came here, and he said, uh, can I cut your vegetables for you? <laughs> and I did. I did, and I made a new friend, and he got some help. It was very charming. Yeah. He was like nothing on TV you can see. Him. He's like a gentle soul and he's smiling all the time. Whatever. It's been 
Yeah, it's I hope Weight fun. Watchers helped them. <laughs> he was on Weight Watchers. <laughs> kind of was like... Anything else? Okay, this is Whitefield. Very nice. That was an excellent job. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you, guys.